Forward. Breaking through to the top and staying there has at all times been the main task of those people, regardless of their profession and position, who were not going to be limited to the minimum wage, allowing them to drag out a miserable existence. In an unrestrained, sometimes unsystematic search for warm places, in addition to money, endowing its ambitious holders with power and authority, we tend to study the experience of those who have already achieved success. This book will give you that kind of knowledge based on a special kind of experience. The main secret of success is very simple, find yourself a place in this or that structure where you can manage others. If you start your quest without white connections and big money, then in order to succeed, you must be smarter, more ambitious and more energetic than your competitors. To put it simply, if you want to achieve real big success, you have to be lucky and ruthless. Let's throw sentimentality away, and remember the saying, to live with wolves is to howl like a wolf. You have to learn how to protect your place from competitors, and at the same time fight for a bigger piece. It will not be easy for you, but believe me, this game is worth the candle. And remember, to stay at the very top, you must have a clear head and be ruthless, really ruthless, the most ruthless. In your system, you will get to know the people you are supposed to know, they will get to know you, you will trust them, and they will trust you, remembering to use you just as you will use them. The laws are easy. You do favors and do your duty, you know what you can and cannot do, and you know what you get for it. If you try, if you become a reliable cover for the elders, then you will definitely grow higher and higher. Upstairs in the difficult world of business, where everyone strives to gnaw through the throat of a neighbor, only those who have perfectly mastered the art of managing others get out. Some part of this managerial gift may be innate, some acquired through experience, but a certain part of it will undoubtedly be the quintessence of the secret knowledge of successful people. Books on management skills and techniques for success abound, but they are all repetitions of theories developed by academics and adopted by corporate circles, theories that are part of the standard Master of Business Administration course of study. These books are trite, overlong, and very often far from the truth. Pi in one of these books never talked about the wisdom of those who run the biggest, most profitable and one of the longest-lasting cartels in the history of capitalism organized crime, known to us as Mafia, Cosa Nostra, Syndicate, Organization, Silent Empire and so on. The Mafia manager for the first time summarizes the knowledge and experience of those very ruthless bosses, luminaries of management, whose methods are much more successful than the brute force of street gangsters or, at first glance, not contrary to the law, the activities of presidents of well-known companies. Unlike a lot of weighty volumes devoted to the principles of management, Mafia Manager does not contain long-winded, terribly boring, and, more often than not, completely meaningless stories of someone else's success. This book very succinctly represents the essence of the Silent Empire's pragmatic leadership philosophy. It contains truly effective advice, interspersed with pearls of hidden wisdom, which are the result of an excellent understanding of human nature, and not primitive manifestations of a criminal nature. I am the Mafia Manager, one can also find grains of wisdom from Machiavelli, the greatest theorist in the field of applied management and leadership, who in his fundamental work The Prince advised the Medici, a person who wants to find goodness in everything will be disappointed living among those who does not recognize the good. Thus, it is worth learning how to move away from goodness and apply or not apply this knowledge depending on the specific situation. Open the Mafia Manager at any time, on any page, and you will always find useful advice. And you can read and reread this book thoughtfully, slowly, and consistently, until the principles and rules set forth in it become an integral part of your behavior, both business and every day. It should not be forgotten that our cruel and insidious world rests on greed and fear. Always remember this, when you analyze the past and when you make plans for the future. Absorb to the last drop the wisdom of the Mafia Manager and a revelation will descend upon you, saying, think and act only for your own good, and you will ascend to the very top. As Nietzsche so aptly remarked, it is warmer on the peaks than the inhabitants of the lowlands think, especially in winter. Yes, there is a place on every peak, but it is not intended for everyone. Part 1, Managing Yourself How to Get Into Business The best way to become a member of the family is to be born into it. If your father is of the family, he will vouch for you and you will enter the cause. 
But in order to quickly climb the corporate pile of bones or get the order with a capital letter, in addition to a guarantee, you must have an impressive resume or have several high-profile cases under your belt. You must have a reputation as a specific guy who is able to answer for himself under any circumstances. A brother, uncle, cousin, brother-in-law, friend or buddy belonging to the family may become your sponsor recommender, but in any case, you need to prove yourself in order to begin to rise in order to pass the initiation and with full right to be considered a full-fledged member of our cause. You should be aware that Cosa Nostra is an international conglomeration of crime families with a well-defined hierarchy of their members, subordinated to one goal, profit. These guys are not too selective in the choice of means to achieve their goal, they are ready for anything, just to provide and increase the income of the family. Five centuries earlier, the Mafia originated in Sicily as a national patriotic organization with lofty interests, but quickly slipped into crime. It took on its modern form in the 1930s, thanks to the efforts of the master of criminal administration, one, Johnny, Fox, Torrio. The same one that brought Capone to the people in Chicago, too. What does mafia mean? Honor, revenge and mutual responsibility. If you want, you can take this term as an abbreviation for the Association of Italian Moms and Dads, Mafia of Mothers and Fathers Italian Association though it probably won't work for you. We specialize in protecting people and their interests, in dispute resolution, in alternative arbitration, three, and in enforcement of obligations, especially in areas where the state prefers to intervene. In the international sense, we remain strong in Sicily, with the aim of increasing commercial potential, expanding our presence around the world. This is our business. It is unfortunate that sometimes the legislation transfers our activity into the category of criminal, thereby throwing us into the oncoming lane. Your cause is the legal world of business, the world of banks and corporations, not very different from our cause, except that our people retire only posthumously. But this difference concerns the end of the life path, and its beginning is exactly the same here and there. First you find the place from which your ascent to the top will begin, in other words, you find the right job. In order to find the right job, you need to correctly assess your strengths, education, experience, skills, evaluate yourself as a person, weigh your connections. Then summarize it all in a summary, emphasizing the quantity and quality of your achievements, confirmed by awards, diplomas, prizes, nominal scholarships, social activities, positions held, and so on. You can exaggerate a little, it never hurts. Designate for yourself, but only for yourself alone, your potential weaknesses, your vulnerable points. Think about how to turn them into virtues if they suddenly pop up during an interview. And constantly work to eliminate them, without relying on outside help. In our cause, we often help people correct their shortcomings, eliminating their carrier along the way. Our method may seem unnecessarily harsh, but it gives 100% effectiveness, and the result is our everything. Find out everything you can about your potential employer, from his place of birth to his secretary's or secretary's favorite brand of underwear, and use this information correctly whenever possible, in correspondence, in telephone conversations, in meetings. Style your resume cover letter in style, as well as the interview follow-up letter. Simply put, do not press, spend money on expensive paper and a good printer. And do not forget to put a piece of personal warmth into your message by adding a few handwritten lines at the end. If you know competitors who intend to take away the chosen place from under your nose, immediately invent a cunning, full of deceit, elimination plan, for now, we are talking about eliminating their candidacies from consideration, nothing more. For this purpose, a well-timed hint, a skillful leak of information, or light praise, even if undeserved, may be suitable. Of course, it is necessary to praise skillfully, so that your own candidacy would not fall out of the consideration process. In the event that your rivals are competent, do not forget about them after all, they are worthy of becoming your subordinates later. When you finally get the job you want, don't forget to send a thank you card to all potential employers who took the time to consider you. Politeness doesn't come cheap, and who knows what will happen in the future. The rules of conduct for the younger ones, both in ours and in your cause, are the same, close your mouth, open your eyes, clean your ears, button up your fly, 
pull up your pants and do as you are told. Of course, as in any other business, juniors are required to duck in every possible way, as they say, they must have the morality of a whore and the manners of a dance teacher, but over time, as you move forward, and you will become a guy who exposes his ass to kisses. Most likely, this is your goal, as well as the goal of any of us, no matter what clothes we put on it. While you are young, watch life, learn from it. Find out how much, understand the motives driving real people in the real world. Make a mark on your nose, regardless of its size, keep your eyes open and your mouth closed. Make yourself, get the right connections, get rid of the shortcomings. At first, this will require a lot of effort from you, but over time, believe me, it will become easier. So much so that your hardest task will be to fight boredom sorrow. At the beginning of a career, each of us needs more than ever the support of a capo, a mentor, patron, rebbe, holy father. Therefore, before you can learn to command, you must learn to obey. And make it a rule to never leave in your team a person who has not learned to follow orders, regardless of his competence, especially if he is talented. When the capo blows, you bend or break. When capo gets hot and loses his temper, you stand still and sweat. When capo laughs, you smile, at least. All of the above is just an illustration of the postulate that subordinates must obey. But do not overdo it so as not to arouse suspicion in the capo with your excessive servility. Excessive deflection can turn into a kiss of death because excessive politeness is tantamount to absolute rudeness. When talking to capo, open your mouth only after being addressed. When talking to outsiders, speak only in support of the capo's position or keep quiet. If additional information is needed, provide it only after you have been asked. In other words, in Fondo, for, being at the base of the pyramid of power, you remain a vassal of your liege lord, five, or his overlord. You stay until you climb up. There is an Italian saying Tratta con quella che sono migliadetti fagli, which translates something like this, communicate with those who are better than you, and pay all your bills. This principle well defines your relationship with the leader. Firmly grasp that none of the tasks assigned to you can be so bastard and, figuratively speaking, bloody, as to give you the right to doubt when it is performed. Since capo is important for your future, you must constantly prove to him that you respect, understand, and appreciate him. What will you do when, by an evil twist of fate, your first mentor gets in the way of your development, on the way of your career? There can be only one answer, to bring him down without hesitation. He has his own destiny, his own career, and you have yours. Leaders have power and authority that you aspire to have. It doesn't matter how they got it or whether they deserve it, what matters is that they have it. They have a power that they can use to your advantage if you do their dirty work for them. For example, Al Capone's mentor in Chicago was Johnny Torrio. The deeds of these outstanding descendants of the ancient Romans can be described in the words of their no less famous countrymen, Veni, Vidi, Vici, Six. Prove to your boss that you are a smart and far-sighted swindler, experienced in office games, but do not try to cheat him, his people, his partners and those who are under his protection. Before you act, decide who is who and what for how much, and act in accordance with the information received. And most importantly, never try to snatch a piece of meat where you have only bread. If the person you work for is sane and talented, make him your leader, your idol, support him and let him support you, finance you, raise you, and, repeat this several times until you get it right, don't even dare to dream about his women, wives, mistresses, daughters, nieces, cousins, maids, prostitutes, secretaries and others. You will be lucky if you can marry the daughter or close relative of your capo, of course with his permission, which is better to get several times, in case he changes his mind. Make sure you understand the boss order correctly before you act. Can you imagine what will happen if you fill up the wrong guy, blow up the wrong house, or, God forbid, give a bribe to the wrong official? Learn the art of asking questions. It comes easy to some, not to others, but it is always necessary. No need to be afraid to seem stupid when you ask again, you need to be afraid to seem stupid when you hit the joint without asking again. 
And one more thing, never write down or sign anything creepy, such as names, addresses, debt amounts, payment procedures, etc. Nothing that could be the number one evidence attached to your criminal case, the case of a shameless jerk. And remember well that, all capos, just like you, started from the bottom. When you climb a pyramid, you are climbing over the pile of bones that make it up. But whoever wants to pick an apple must first climb a tree. Right? Office Politics In our business, business is done in friendly conversations over coffee, hunting, weddings, funerals, golfing, fishing, or underground casinos, in short, wherever it is possible to communicate personally, only personally, with colleagues. For months, or even years, calm reigns everywhere, but suddenly, when the time comes, or simply on someone's ass, the hair stands on end, then movement begins. Reasons can be very different. For example, one of the drivers climbed into the passenger seat and received a certain status in the organization. Or someone somewhere with us, due to imprudent behavior, retired, and with the good fortune, simply drove off to his country estate, where there is more grass and light for playing with grandchildren than in a cemetery. Or someone suddenly disappeared, as if sunk into the water, dissolving into oblivion along with his car and his compares, seven, dot in real life, before you can become a driver for one of the big guys, thus securing not only a piece of bread and butter, jam and even caviar, but also a career opportunity, you must become an initiate member of our cause. And in order to successfully complete the initiation, you must make your first bones, that is, do some kind of wet work, sewage or underwater concrete work, in other words, take part in an event to organize someone's disappearance. The hint is clear, isn't it? And before you say, that's not for me, know that this is the wrong answer. In order to qualify for a big career advancement in your business, you have to make the bones one way or another, just like us sinners. This law brings us back to office politics, the arena where you have to make your first bones in order to start moving up. It's highly likely that you've taken one of those useful managerial fitness tests that team with Glamour magazines, giving answers like, I feel like I'm thinking when I make decisions, I'm constantly coming up with new ideas, I always learn from my mistakes, I like meeting people. Remembered? And now forget it. In these tests, any dim-witted consumer of gloss will kill Julius Caesar, but it is unlikely that she will be able to draw a knife in a street showdown. And management sometimes looks exactly like a street showdown. And here's another thing, it is generally believed that one who has not been tested by an evil will is unable to understand a good one. Becoming a manager, in yours or ours, requires looking for the best chance for yourself in every situation, and if that means cutting someone's throat, you should do it without hesitation. Must means must. Office politics is a collection of dirty secrets. Office politics never stops. It is done everywhere, in offices, and in toilets, and in places of evening corporate libations. If in your business office politics is implemented in a much shorter time than in ours, this does not mean that its results cannot be just as destructive. How else can they? Let's move on to tactics. Always be guided by one universal principle and carry loyalty to it throughout your life, through all the milestones and stages of your brilliant career. Carry it through, and in the final stages pass it to the smaller brothers, remembering to make them plow on themselves without unbending. Here is the principle, the principle of principles, in order to stay alive, be patient, look around, listen, and say as little as possible. To win, be patient, stay alive, make a plan and strike suddenly. Be patient. And do not forget to promptly correct or extinguish any rumors and gossip that can harm you. At first, being involved in office politics, or rather this constant battle for survival, may seem like something extreme to you. Take heart. Remember that there will always be a colleague, comrade, ally, like-minded person nearby, ready to set you up. So you must know about him or her in order to protect yourself. Collect information about him, don't forget to use the office telegraph for this, prepare well and strike first. Deal with him the same way he prepared to deal with you while he prepares to throw. But at the same time, be everyone's friend, a friend to every man, woman, errand boy in every existing office faction, without openly joining any of them. Be cordial and friendly with everyone, but remember to keep your distance. 
Do not stand out from your colleagues in anything and either retire, nor behavior, nor stories about how wildly you spend your free time. Of course, you will want to quietly sit out most of the small and useless battles without taking part in them. What do you care that they decided to shorten the lunch break of the secretaries, and they rebelled against this monstrous encroachment on their sacred rights? What do you care about this? Of course, you can consider what happened as an injustice, but at the dawn of your career, remember that the company does not care about you as deeply as they do about secretaries. Like any of them, you are an easily replaceable part of a large machine. By supporting the demands of the secretaries, you thereby ruin your own career, promising and promising. Every spark should not be allowed to burn into a flame. Perhaps you have not yet been convincingly shown how despotic, short-sighted, deceitful, petty, stupid and quarrelsome most of the top managers of your company. You will have time and opportunity to verify this, believe me. Convince and reconcile. Top management is best described by the saying that the higher a baboon climbs a palm tree, the more visible its bald ass is to everyone. Usually, the older and larger the company, the more injustice in it. Injustice, of course, from your point of view. From the position of the company's management and our own position, we are also a very large company, business and justice have nothing in common. Although, of course, through the efforts of our dons, our cause looks like a congregation of followers of Mother Teresa. An example in our favor, we always tell the guys about the risks in our business, such as death or a business trip, which is also a prison. The big companies, our mega corporations, swollen with pride like peacocks, tell you nothing but lies. The truth reaches the lower level only by accident, through someone's indiscretion. The most you can do is to endure and wait for your chance. Be patient, hold on, dig in and lie still to survive. Know that the fall of the aged emperors is at hand, and thousands of opportunities will fall into your hands both during the collapse of their power and after it. No wonder they say that the best weapon of a hunter is his patience. Listen, study, beating off a step and saluting, except these meager in comparison with what a top manager grabs, increases. Keep smiling while you do this, and if you want to be a chocolate ass, keep a work journal, many of the How to Succeed guides recommend it, and use it to justify your pay raise requests. Do you understand about the magazine? This is a notebook or computer file where you enter your achievements, completed projects, completed plans and indicate how they have brought your crappy company, how much money you have saved them, or what fabulous profits you have achieved, mind you, keeping a work journal can get you a little bigger raise, but that journal will never get you a fucking cool job. The magazine is just an extra deflection for your boss, who will always suspect, or even accuse you of eyewash, even if he does not wear glasses. Keep it simple, send your boss a memorandum at the end of the project to document your involvement and demonstrate your belief that your boss will read it. Clear pepper, in our case, nothing gets on paper more legibly than bird poop. So, the essence of office politics is that you do your job with your mouth shut, with the discipline of the truest of slaves, expanding your alliances to the maximum, collecting obligations and collecting bills, exercising and biting off pieces and doing the work forfeited, both independently and in cooperation. With your people, while not forgetting the work that was originally intended for you or came to you after being swamped by your colleagues. The more allies, the more sources of information, the very information that is vital for you. Information will always pay off, regardless of what and how it is paid for and from whom it is received. Steal what can't be bought and don't get caught, and what can't be bought or stolen, knock it out. Metaphorically, or, you understand. The reason you are portraying all the one of many is to ensure the calm collection of information that flows towards you from all directions. The office telegraph is the most reliable source of it, of course, provided that you can filter the empty, separating the wheat from the chaff. In any case, this very telegraph is ten times more reliable than all internal memorandums or pompous speeches of the leadership. Always and everywhere, for reasons incomprehensible to the rest of humanity, top management hides what they know, willingly indulging in lies for the sake of it. At the same time, top management is most often not aware of the actions of middle managers. Only secretaries know everything. 
The top management of companies is usually isolated from employees and does not like to listen to them. Don't listen and you won't hear is the motto of senior management. Its members do not even listen to themselves. On your career path, you will certainly be offered a dead project, bullshit, empty. It happens to everyone. If you can pass this project on to someone else, Jim has always been interested in this topic. He even told me that he was going to go to university this spring to study it properly, do it without hesitation. The golden rule is if you don't see the end of the road yourself, send someone else instead. But if it is impossible to disown, 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 then do everything in your power to solve the task assigned to you. Thus, you will slightly raise your authority, these cretins, who threw a weighty piece of shit at your hem, admit that you have a sense of duty. Not much, of course, but grabbing at least something from the black sheep is already good. Especially if you don't have a choice. You must ensure that your team's product is recognized within the company. Your capo tells the bosses about your abilities, you send short and concise memorandums to the lower and middle management, written on the case, but in fact they are your personal advertising company, you are friends with a bunch of people of different status, you are not part of any office clique, but admired by all. Your happiness is near, but, at this moment, your enemies come to life and begin to act. For example, you have just returned from a long business trip to the Zarechensko Zazapinsky branch, ZZF, where you did your best to bring a loss-making division filled with old lazy donkeys to a more or less acceptable level of profitability. It would be nice to arrange a second Pearl Harbor there, but in Zarechensky Zazapinsk, all employees traditionally leave work only for retirement. A simple dismissal will provoke a lot of unwanted lawsuits and legal complications, which is why you were sent there to ensure a voluntary retirement of donkeys. You filled them with obviously impossible work. You refuse to help them and provide the necessary information. You listen to their deliberately peppy jokes on the topic of overloads with an invariable sour lean mind, while not forgetting to constantly change instructions and reduce deadlines. And you won, soon they fled, like rats running from a sinking ship. You remove the most persistent with a probationary period, and knowing that people tend to keep their nose to the wind, you were sure that they would rush to look for another job. Working your ass off in the ZZF, you didn't make any friends, but you did get a sense of accomplishment. You did the impossible. You have successfully completed the task assigned to you. In our business, a similar task is a business trip to the zone on the capo's assignment. It's hard, of course, but, as a result, you advance in the system. The boss helps you sit down, of course, with your consent, but he takes care of your family while you eat government money and also covers you and your business. Of course, all this is done if you have the spirit and insolence, if you are a specific sane kid who does not rat, does not knock, does not show off. Spirit and audacity are the qualities most valued by the men of honor. So you return on the wings of victory to learn from your sources, from your many informants, that your triumph has embittered every possible rival in your department. Such information is not always presented in an undistorted form, but you must be able to filter out, isolate useful information. Well, you have foreseen something like this and are ready to act. Proceed with caution, your opponent may be a vicious, wild-eyed leprechaun, a monster with a big mouth, a selfish cretin, but you must never show him that you think he is who he is. On the contrary, please him in every possible way and generally behave as if you intend to become his best friend. Start your counter-maneuvers before your opponent moves. Leak disinformation into the office telegraph constantly, as they say, drop by drop. Something lately, our Joe looks terribly tired. He must have swallowed too much of his work and choked. I don't know how true this is, but I heard that the bosses of Mega Super Corporation offered Joe a great job. It will be difficult for us to find a replacement for him. Don't forget about your mutual boss, Joe's people set him up big on the last project, but one can only admire his patience and kindness towards them. And finally, the final coup de grace, eight, set up, carried out using one of Joe's trusted sycophants, that's it, paragraph. They got me. I'll tell you a secret that from next month I work at Mega Super Corporation. The Rubicon has been crossed. On the same day, 
Joe treats the head of your department with this news. A day later, you are invited to an interview at the head office, where you proudly display your letter to Mega Super Corporation with a resolute rejection of their offer. It doesn't matter if it was real, the main thing is to present a copy of the letter with your refusal. A few more days later, the secretary of the head of the department will tell that Joe was called to the showdown, exemplarily crucified and fucked for lack of team spirit and a tendency to misinform management. This self-absorbed son of a bitch has been warned that he is one of those individuals that your company does not want to tolerate in its ranks. Imagine, one employee framed another. Oh, what meanness! In our cause, they usually don't bother with suggestions if a person is worth something, and if not, we simply put a leaden end to the matter. And in the body too. You collect information, try to keep a low profile, do good, do favors and save bills that will definitely come in handy someday, bite off the next pieces and make your bones. Everything flows, everything changes. El Biaptayam Povera, good times will come. And at the same time, always be careful in everything, do not trust anyone. Business. Business. Mafia business is business, 9. We don't like hurting people, tearing their balls off, breaking off their thumbs, cracking their kneecaps, cracking their skulls, and throwing kicks. What for? Why? Most often, in order to hook up with the right people, we just give them a lot of money. Is there a more American way? We are simply looking out for our own interests. Why extra problems if a person understands us and honestly cooperates with us? But if you try to scam us, then don't wait for lawsuits, police reports, hearings in the Senate or Congress. You must have heard of I Am Us Toys, 10? Bot government is just such a toy. It belongs to us and we control it. Keep in mind that what we don't have and have no control over is not worth wasting your precious time on. Once one of us said golden words, we are more than US Steel, 11. And no, boy, that we are so much more today than we were then. How did we manage to achieve this? With the help of the good old methods. All people work with other people using these glorious, reliable methods. Thank God, human nature is very predictable. All people respond to incentives and rewards, and the main eternal values for them were and remain greed and fear. Here are the basic business principles. Do business with strangers as if they were your brothers, and with your brothers as if they were strangers to you. The most valuable thing in your business relationship is your reputation for integrity. You will achieve success without much difficulty if you learn to portray honesty sincerely, easily, gracefully, naturally, and convincingly. We only own what we can grab and keep. The price of a product is more expensive than its qualities, the purchase is more expensive than a freebie. A handful of opportunities is worth more than a whole wagon load of justice. The golden rule of business is, whoever has the most power and who makes the rules has the gold. If the brew in the pot boils, stir it with a long spoon so as not to burn your hand. If your house is on fire, warm up. Do not interfere in other people's business, but pay attention to someone else's success. If your neighbor gets up early, make it a rule to get up even earlier. Never give advice to partners if you do not benefit from it. And never start acting with just one piece of advice. Get a second and third opinion, just remember to be careful, after all, your reliable partners and your loyal employees may want you to lose. Alas, the government always notices excessive success. And without success, you are nothing. The trend of our business, like any law-abiding enterprise, is to develop through the absorption of successful businesses. Often this is obtained only as a result of a stubborn, exhausting struggle. Everyone knows about hostile takeovers. We invented them. In the world of free enterprise, the big thieves always protect the little ones. To our great regret, hostile and friendly takeovers often end in the bankruptcy of the acquired company, and part of the management is thrown overboard. Despite everything, our principles are honor, revenge and solidarity. We are convinced that we will not see justice as our own ears if we do not provide it for ourselves. We tirelessly earn credibility, and therefore we deserve respect. 
Keep these truths in mind as you climb the stairs to success, and don't forget that you will always have a fat target on your back. He who seeks, let him find. But sometimes it is better not to start searching at all. Do you agree? Problems. With the right reserves of patience and perseverance, even the most dangerous and serious problems can disappear by themselves. True, this will take a lot, maybe even a lot of time. However, when solving problems, you should not rely on time alone. In addition, often, in particular, this is inherent in big problems, the prospects for resolving them on your own are so blurred and so distant that you decide to intervene and take control of the situation. When you take on big problems, always count on the worst of the results, but by all means, even at the cost of some losses, try to avoid it. Tackle, combine, look for opportunities, pick options. Never make plans based on the best scenario, and if you are lucky, grab luck by the tail, but remember to be careful. Look around, once again calculate everything that can be calculated, and act. As they say in Sicily, if God throws you a plum open your mouth. Of course, extreme problems require extreme solutions. Who argues? From time immemorial, starting with Adam and Eve, all global problems come from people. In Infondo, 12, there are two kinds of people, those who take bribes and those who give them. So be to those who give them, give a lot and in a variety of bills. You have already realized that you can buy a lot of people, making them your allies, your soldiers and even lieutenants. It's good that at least we get enemies for free. Many things in the world are beyond our control, but we can manipulate and influence others. Unfortunately, this does not always work, and as a result, we have a problem. Sometimes this problem is so colossal that it can even destroy the family or some other organization. Suffice it to recall what happened to the temple when Samson held its roof. That is why a far-sighted and prudent manager always focuses his efforts on making his people extremely happy with bribes. This factor ensures team cohesion, making its members loyal and, figuratively speaking, deaf, dumb and blind. Sometimes it is necessary to solve problems rudely and harshly. Make sure that the lesson is learned not only by the lost sheep, but also by the rest of the herd, sorry, by the team. When you deal with someone, Bring to the rest not only the essence of your act, but also its reasons. As the saying goes, punishing one, teach a hundred. It is perfectly natural to deceive others, and unnaturally to deceive oneself. When planning your actions, developing your scams, you must be sure that you yourself will not fall a victim to them. Never lie to yourself. Don't expect anyone to eat for breakfast what you eat for dinner. As one of us so aptly put it, shit doesn't smell like roses. When looking for a solution to a particularly difficult problem, take the time to dig into the past. Torrio, Capone, Luciano, Costello, Genovese, Accardo and many of our other managers, as well as many of the free shooters we put up with, were true organizational and management geniuses. Learn from them, optimize their methods. Tailor their decisions to suit your circumstances. Do as they do, but don't repeat their mistakes. Okay? Where is the key to their managerial wisdom and organizer talent hidden? What is their secret? It is that subordinates were afraid of them as much as opponents. All the weighty management manuals say that respect is the key to managing people. And therefore, to the resolution of problems. This is partly true, because fear is the highest degree of respect. Shortly before going to prison for tax evasion, Al Capone explained to one of the reporters how he made the Chicago branch work effectively, people who do not respect anyone are in awe of those who inspire them with horror. So I built my organization on the foundation of their fear. But please don't misunderstand me. Those who work with me are not afraid of anything. Those who work for me are loyal to me, not because they get good money slash, but because they know what it means for them to lose my trust. Create your own system for responding to human problems with a set of ready-made solutions, ranging from soft talk to harsh thrashing, from cutting incomes and inflicting grievous bodily harm to the extreme measure of getting rid of the problem by eliminating its source. 
Keep in mind that you can avoid unnecessary work by transferring the solution to the problem in the wrong hands, competitors, the police, or, for example, the board of directors. Remember that all the mistakes made by the founding fathers of our cause were caused by the most terrible human defect, pride. No wonder it is said that people break their legs not on mountains, but on bumps. Time management. Don't overwork yourself, but work smart. Make others go all out for you. Gossip, discussion of sports news and other chatter are also related to work. At least for the most part. But tell me frankly, brothers, have you yourself ever listened to those tapes that legalists play in federal court? Is it possible to understand that we are mumbling to each other there? I advise you to develop a code beyond the understanding of the federal government and then talk as much as you like and about what you want. It doesn't hurt to make sure you understand each other first, though. In our business, we strike from time to time. These are serious blows, not slaps on a chess clock. Our work often turns into long pauses between tasks, during which brains melt with boredom. Use this time correctly, make it work for you. Read anything other than restaurant menus. Listen not only to rap, but also educational records that help self-education, or, for example, audiobooks. In short, do something other than wipe down your pants at the base, play cards, talk about chicks, divorces, and plans for the future. Sure, common courtesy requires you to spend some of your time with colleagues, but only some, not all of the time. And who said that time should be wasted aimlessly? Wasting time is stealing from yourself. Since many of our people are ambitious but lazy, a young person who wants to make it to the top must use his free time productively. This approach will do him good, it will fill his pockets with money, add to his power, and also bring glory and authority to his bosses. Think about it. Choose the time of day that you are most productive and do your business during these hours. We meet with partners, hold events, and receive visitors only when we are in the best shape. We score arrows, threaten, give kicks, pokes and cuffs, break limbs, shoot heads and smile at friend or foe, underline as appropriate, only when the time has come for it. Do the same. Act in time, not a minute earlier, not a minute later. If you are forced to do something at an inconvenient time for you, speak shorter than a short one and appear there only to appear in front of people and reschedule the meeting to a time convenient for you. Get it on your nose that effective time management doesn't mean hard scheduling. Neither your work schedule, nor your meeting schedule, nor your strategic plans should be rigid. After all, no one can predict what will happen tomorrow. Whose neck will be twisted, who will be run over by a car, and on whose head a brick will fall. In addition, each of us can be pissed off by small daily troubles. Your best investment in your business is your time. Keep this in mind and use your time effectively creating schedules and plans. Know your topic, know your goals. Correctly assess the obstacles and opportunities to develop the right strategy. Here are some of the basic time-saving rules we love to follow. We always park in the second row, locking everyone else in. We don't spend two hours trying to beat a poor 200 bucks out of a client. We have lawyers who get it done without any pressure. We will never do ourselves what we can breed for, what we can pay for or what we can order someone to do for respect and respect. Some of us deliberately set our clocks 10 minutes back. Why show up first at a meeting, ceremony or shooter and die of boredom while waiting for the rest? Better let them wait for us, unless, of course, they are our bosses. In relation to the bosses, we are extremely punctual, there is no market. We change clothes everywhere we go regularly, in clubs, in gyms, in favorite taverns, in the apartments of our mistresses everywhere, as already mentioned. Thanks to this rule, we are always clean and fresh, which means we do not have to spend time buying or stealing clean clothes, and also returning home for them. In our business, especially if you're one of the juniors, you can be yanked to work at any moment, 24 hours a day. At any hour of the day or night, you must break loose on the phone. Even if you have a day off, a vacation or a wedding ceremony, business should come first to you. All other matters, including wives and mistresses, fade into the background. Time is different, the time of business, the time of rest, 
the time of imprisonment. Being on a business trip, you live one day, independently managing your time. If you do something for the boss, do it quickly. Help a subordinate without much haste. But you need to do something for the police or for the government through a stump deck and only in the case when there is no way to get out of it. And everything else, everything that you do not for the boss, your lads, your family, your friends, business partners, cops, the government, you do only when there is a desire in time. Freedom of choice, motherfucker. You already know the principles, strategy and tactics of effective time management. It's time to get acquainted with the main gears of this mechanism, clear pepper, while not forgetting the theoretical foundations. Effective time management means making the most of every minute spent at work, while understanding that every day there are hours, every week there are days, every month there are weeks, and every year there are months in which you do not need to strain at work. This postulate, well, like a law, you understand, is the holy grail, it's such a cool thing that everyone has heard of, but no one has seen it. Just like an honest policeman, of effective time management for everyone but nutty workaholic nerds. Our principle, work smart, don't work long. Here are three basic rules for effective time management. Schedule your assignments. Pass them on to others. Pass on what's left to others. In management seminars, goofy lecturers describe creating the perfect workspace as an essential attribute of effective time management, creating quiet time, reducing distractions and irritants, increasing determination, focusing effort, and so on. These strategies complicate things immeasurably, monstrously, endlessly. You can kill more than one year to prepare and implement such a completely useless and stupid system. Like all major management systems, time management can be reduced to common sense. If you know how to manage your time, you need to work no more than six hours a day, and far from daily. The ideal workspace is one where you feel comfortable working. It can be a table in a cafe, your kitchen table, the interior of your car, an empty office in your office, any place where you are not bothered and distracted, where you work comfortably and calmly. Choose the best time of the day or night, as we have already said, take a cup of coffee or tea and let your thoughts go. If everything is done right, if you find and create the perfect workspace and choose the right time, then your brain will start working and come up with solutions to problems. Take a yellow notebook, 13, divide the page into two parts with a vertical line and write the date in the upper right corner. In the left column, write what needs to be done, preferably in abbreviations that only you can understand, prioritizing according to the value of the tasks and their urgency, and remembering to balance these criteria. So, you have scheduled tasks. Now in the right vertical column, as far as possible, distribute these same tasks among others. You delegated. After that, analyze the columns, reprioritizing where appropriate or necessary, handing over even more tasks. Keep doing this for as long as your mind suggests changes or additions. Here you have distributed part of the tasks to yourself, giving the greater part to others, acting according to the importance of these tasks. Tomorrow you will check what has already been done and start a new day with a two-column sheet, destroying the old one, of course, unless you are an idiot who dreams of spending half his life on bunk beds, leaving the care of your maintenance to the state, changing, distributing, redistributing and changing again. This is effective time management based on the art of delegation. Write a similar page for the tasks of the week and another one for long-term strategic projects. Strength and power begin today. As the Sicilians say, it's too late to look for salt when the pasta has already been eaten. Remember, as already mentioned, planning cannot be a rigid one-time action, especially strategic planning. It is a process subject to constant correction depending on certain life circumstances, which cannot be foreseen. Be flexible. This rule was well remembered by old Mustache Peters the first mafioso in the United States, until a certain moment, and then, satisfied and reassured by the new state of things, they forgot. Old Mustache Peters are long dead and have become part of history, having taught us a good lesson. To allocate time and make plans, you must know your goals, and know them qualitatively and quantitatively. Suppose you set yourself the grand strategic goal of retiring at 40 with a million dollars. 
Once you have set a goal, you must evaluate the obstacles and opportunities, and then strategize in tactic, always keeping your resources and predictable risks in mind. After that, you plan how to achieve this goal, in other words, you decide who should do what, in what sequence, where, when and how, with whom, with what, for how much. This will be your operational plan, defining a group of tasks that must be completed in a certain period of time. And then you must delegate. After all, it is impossible to have time to do everything yourself. So you won't reach the age of 40, you will throw back your hooves earlier, like a driven horse. Let's say you work for an organization that requires you to be in the office from 9 to 5. The art of time management in this situation will be the ability to keep the door of your office closed, allowing only those you want to see, and only when you want to see them, to enter. Your secretary is your gatekeeper, your Cerberus, your bodyguard, and your guardian angel. If any of your people manage to get past her and risk sticking their head into your office without permission, asking, are you busy, boss, you answer him with a threatening yes. You can growl, bury your fangs, take out a bazooka from a desk drawer, or just throw heavy objects. When you meet your employee in your office and he starts pouring a fountain of ideas on you, or simply starts empty calls, don't get lost, put a stack of papers in front of you, bend over them and say, thank you, that's enough. I have to finish some urgent work. Finita la comedy. If you don't like answering phone calls yourself, some managers like to get information directly from the handset for some reason, give your secretary a list of people you can connect to immediately, keep it as short as possible, and ask her to record messages from everyone the rest. At about the same time every day, answer important calls or those that you consider significant. Do not worry, the one who needs it will call back again. If there is no end in sight to your interlocutor's chatter during a telephone conversation, just hang up and dial the next number. Few dare to believe that you hung up, most, to save their pride, will blame the telephone exchange. If you have already tried this tactic on this interlocutor the other day, then, for a change, try silence. Do not answer. Don't react. Don't breathe into the tube. Nothing should reach the ears of your interlocutor, nothing at all. Very soon, your interlocutor will get nervous and shut up. If your interlocutor is an important person, or just a person close to you, but you are tired, Tell him that in a minute you have an important meeting, this will help. The closed door of your office does not have the right to block your access to workplaces, halls and nooks and crannies of your office, when you have a desire and want to, spreading fun, vigor and fear among your subordinates, see with your own eyes who, how and what they are with. Are engaged, and in general, what the hell, in kind, is going on under your very nose. Decision Making Before making any important decision, it is necessary to collect the maximum amount of the most reliable information that can be available, do not hesitate to knock it out of the owner if necessary, and carefully evaluate. Discuss the information received with worthy and trusted people, analyze, outline the worst-case scenario, add positive and negative factors, discuss them with your consigliere and do what your intuition tells you. A person with intuition is Percosi Dyer, 14, a person with a sense of place and a sense of time, will reach sky-high heights in any business. But when your intuition fails you at a specific important event, it means the end or prison. Note to yourself that this is truly an eternal theme in our business, and therefore all our decisions must be calculated taking into account the stabilizing factor of the cemetery or prison, integrated into the system of checks and balances. It can be assumed that the consequences of mistakes in your business are not so dramatic and not so fatal, although you know better. In less important situations, define the problem, gather facts, find solutions, and try to weigh their implications, realizing well that every maybe usually outweighs can't be. Consult with people worthy of respect, talk to your consigliere. Then put these problems out of your head for a while. Your subconscious will still continue to work on their solution, and very often the right decision will come to you by itself, unconsciously. It may sound as naive as going to a fortune teller, but trust us, this approach works, and it works in most cases. To effectively pump the situation to make a decision, concentrate the most reliable information in your head. Consult. Think it over. Then decide based on what your inner spirit, your intuition tells you. 
When making a decision, whether small or large, be sure to keep the following in mind. 1. The specific nature of the problem. 2. Facts that seem real to you. 3. Alternatives, their possible consequences, negative and, or, positive. Then take an interest in the opinions of others, give free rein to the subconscious and intuition and make a decision. Look back only to evaluate the results and draw a conclusion for the future. And don't forget to always, always keep your lottery tickets. In conclusion, if, having made a decision, you still find yourself in a deep ass, do what everyone does in your or our cause, switch the arrows to someone else, hang your joint on him and quickly eliminate the consequences, correct mistakes and of course, punish the guilty. Friends. Friends will never equal family. Friendship loyalty should not be confused with blood ties. Friends can be purchased, and purchased for a different price. The family is eternal, large or small, hungry or full, fino alla fescia, 15, to the bitter end, with the exception of exceptional exceptions. True, in any family there is an eternal problem caused by genetics. Simply put, every family has its share of idiots, cretins, morons, morons, defectives, bureaucrats, alcoholics, sluts, drug addicts, and traitors. Usually they reveal themselves immediately, so do not forget about the necessary precautions. You can pity and console some lost souls, but you can't scold them publicly, especially since this criticism usually doesn't lead to anything good. The main problem in communicating with friends is their sincerity. Betraying you from time to time, as soon as you stumble, they say, looking into your eyes, nothing personal, business is business. They always remain faithful to money and power, justifying themselves with the same hackneyed phrase. You will know your friends only by trying them in action. Until then, don't let yourself be sure of them. While everything is in order with you, you will not be able to check your friends, it is not for nothing that they say that a friend is known in trouble. And in general, never trust anyone completely. The true mafioso has no friends, he has interests. Can friendship and loyalty be bought? 500 years ago, Machiavelli said the following about friends, it can be said of people that they are in general ungrateful, fickle, hypocritical, cowardly, wanting to avoid danger and thirsty for gain, as long as you benefit them, they are entirely yours, friendship is acquired through sale and purchase, acquired without guarantees and in a moment is not ready to serve you. The old man knew a lot about life. Some advise, do not do business with friends and their relatives. Others advise, do not borrow money from friends and do not lend them. We don't think so. We follow the opposite principle, albeit with some precautions. Judge for yourself how can a small friendship stand in the way of a big business? By what right? If you have to deal harshly with a friend, then you are in a winning position. You know his weaknesses and habits, and this one gives you the opportunity to act more effectively against him. Nothing personal, just business. Never brag to your friends about your success in business, they will not believe you, they will condemn you for bravado, they will become jealous. Do not tell them about your business problems, they will gloat and tell your enemies about it, for whom your failure will sound the signal to attack. And never believe what your friends say about your enemies. When you get to the top, you will have a lot of friends. Keep in mind that friends who appeared after you became the big boss should be on double suspicion. To hell with friends. All you need is as many allies as possible. It is not necessary to have sympathy for them, the main thing is to have common interests. The history of mankind is full of relevant examples. Enemies. When you bring your friends closer, don't forget to bring your enemies even closer. The most dangerous enemy is the madman, Pazzo, 16, it is impossible to negotiate with him, logic is alien to him, he is not afraid of death, he does not care about the fate of those who are close to him. It must be destroyed, quickly and accurately. The same principle applies to other enemies, they must be destroyed or they will begin to take revenge. What happens to enemies that are not destroyed? They are flourishing, just look at Germany and Japan. Be afraid of your enemies, the absence of fear leads to fatal consequences. 
Look for your enemies in the most unusual places, under the bed, on the bed, in yourself. The main and only advantage of a clear enemy is that you know who he is. A man without enemies is a man without virtues. Only completely worthless people do not have enemies. Do not agree? Remember that even Christ had many enemies, many. Always expect the worst from your enemies and you will be less likely to make mistakes. Avoid haste, remember that revenge is a dish best eaten cold. Axioms The world belongs to the patient. Some are careful not to lose. If you play carefully, you will definitely lose. Think a lot, talk a little, and write even less. Learn to say I don't know. If you want to take your anger out on someone, first make sure you don't become your own victim. A servant of two masters lies to one of them. In other words, two owners have a pig starving. You can't win fair, win dirty. Or make others fight for you. You can hide the fire, you can't hide the smoke. Even a mouse has three holes. Young people think old people are fools. Old people know that they once were. The best way to win a discussion is to start by prioritizing logic over threats and end up beating the bastard, making an agreement. If your budget allows, you can buy your opponent's arguments, but be careful, you are setting a precedent. It is much more profitable for you if your enemies think that you are insane, and not rational insane. One grain does not fill the bag, but the trouble is the beginning. Blowing on the fire, sparks fly into the eyes. Hunger makes bread a cake and beans a steak. Opportunity creates a thief, a thief who has no opportunity to steal thinks he is honest. There is nothing easier than promises. If you need to hit, hit hard, for sure, so as not to be afraid of revenge. If you allow your enemies or friends to think for a moment that they are your equal, they will immediately consider themselves your bosses. Don't try to avoid your enemies, just control them. Know everything about them, know where they are, what they think and who they trust. Promise little, but deliver much. When you are angry, close your mouth and open your eyes. And best of all, never get angry. Try to do two things at once that are impossible to combine, think that sometimes good things can happen without any effort on your part. Never underestimate this trinity, the ability of the enemy, the cunning of the enemy, and the greed of the enemy but never overestimate them. Whoever is responsible for others must pay their bills. Silence is the only way to keep a secret. Always cross the street in the company of a beautiful woman. To put it simply, doing something, do it with style, elegance, and spectacularity. People who snore usually pretend to be asleep. If you're lying, try to be brief. Multiply the negative factors of any of your projects by two and divide the positive ones in half. Be flexible. Once you stop being flexible, you die. Be flexible. This is an iron and absolutely inflexible rule. The most flexible element gradually becomes dominant in the system. Decide who you want to be and do whatever it takes to get there. Bear in mind that you do not have to decide how you should be for others. At the right time, they will discover it for themselves. It's better to break a shoe than hurt your foot. Study common wisdom so that you can avoid it later. Only in extremely rare cases, try to repeat your encore success. No credit is worth as much to a person as his own cash. There are no coincidences. Never. Carefully open your mouth and your wallet. A smart street lieutenant does some of the dirty work himself, after making sure his soldiers know about it. You can't forget what you don't know. And used weapons do not shed blood. Nothing follows from nothing. The only way to fight the bulls is to beat them until they are forced to retreat. Betrayal is the best weapon against betrayal. Some losses are better than wins, and some wins are worse than losses. Listen to advice that gives you an edge, but don't give anyone that kind of advice. Do not shake the green apple tree, the ripe apple will fall by itself. Always pull the snake out of the hole with someone else's hands. 
A crow mowing under a seagull will drown. You often lose your bait when fishing. These are unavoidable and necessary expenses. Do not search for a ford with both feet. Those who cannot act as they should should act as best they can. Accept what can't be fixed. Make sure you can act the way you're supposed to, or don't make it your goal. There are so few virgins in the world who are not exhausted from their lack of demand. Haste is the mother of failure. And pride is their father. Whoever wants to hang himself is easy to put in a noose. Necessity breaks all laws. God will give, but first give yourself. Not only do not kill, but also do not be killed. If you are forced to bow, bow very, very low. And keep a bitter memory of it until you can take revenge. To hammer a nail blindly, you need to hit a thousand times. Do what you are good at. Frequently replanted trees rarely bear fruit. There are no harmless enemies. Don't touch the problem until it touches you. Let the enemy help you. Insolence in business is the first quality. And the second. And third. And most importantly. Set priorities. If crocodiles are sharpening their teeth on your ass, you must first of all drain the swamp in which they live. The world lives on the principle of you to me, I to you. It is not enough to have a thousand friends, it is enough to have one enemy. Do not destroy other people's scams, because someday you will find yourself in the same situation. If you can't win, try to raise the price of your opponent's victory above your profitability. If necessary, complicate your plans, but give only simple orders. Be correct with everyone, sociable with many, close to the elite, friend to units. A fool cannot hide his wisdom. The best armor is to be out of range. When the game is done, make sure you have the bank. The fool will always laugh at your jokes. After strength, cunning. After cunning, victory. Your enemy is not as powerful as you think. Same as you. Don't throw a boomerang at your enemies unless you're ready to catch it. After the victory, do not hide the weapon too quickly. Hold on tight to the hand you can't cut off. A vulture's best friend is a dead horse. In other words, every bastard can find his use. Part 2. Managing Others. Recruitment. If you manage people, then from time to time you have to hire them. As soon as your hired employees start working, you find that most of them are less competent than you expected, and absolutely less competent than it seemed when reading their resumes or after interviewing them. Clear stump, they were engaged in self-praise, rubbing your glasses and forgetting that a monkey in a tuxedo is still a monkey. What to do, people, with all their shortcomings, this is the material with which you have to work, and it is on them that your own success, the success of a manager, depends. We don't like big families with many soldiers and officers. This is not our choice. We believe that the fewer people, the less problems, fewer jams, less betrayals, and less disappointments. More employees means more problems and other hemorrhoids, and also more overhead costs. And we are used to saving our money, as well as our nerves. Keep in mind that in key positions you must find people of the best, excellent quality. In this case, one wise guy is worth a thousand idiots. For the really responsible job of managing other people and getting the results you want from them, never hire yesterday's students, no matter how overwhelming their resumes. Look for a man who has already proven himself capable of managing people. When choosing people for less important positions, you have the right to prefer attitude to experience. This attitude manifests itself in various ways. For example, asking a question about salary at the very beginning of the interview clearly demonstrates the negative and, in addition, the mental inferiority of the questioner. In vital positions, never take a recognized expert, no matter how long the list of his achievements. The venerable experts, these narcissistic jerks, only care about two things, their reputation and their fees, and nothing more. 
Never employ more than one member of the same family, with the exception of your own, of course, never think of working together as spouses or even lovers, regardless of their personal qualities, regalia, and competence. Do not hire anyone without an interview, interview. Spend it slowly, giving candidates time to think about the answers to your questions. Be specific. Remember that general questions get general, that is, useless, answers. Demand concrete answers from candidates and do not forget about clarifying questions. Let's talk about interview strategy. If possible, seat candidates not in front of you, but next to you. So you can better monitor their vegetative reactions, movements, including eye movements, discoloration of the skin, sweating, convulsive swallowing, and so on. Scan his resume with your eyes, remembering to frown in response to obvious nonsense. After finishing your presentation and bringing the applicant to a pre-heart attack, ask why he wants to get this particular job and why he is sure that he is suitable for it. Let him speak in his own defense, asking clarifying questions from time to time. And if the candidate is currently employed, don't forget to ask why he wants to change jobs. With distrust, repeat the last phrase he said, as if tasting it, and then lay the cards on the table, state to him your requirements for this position, emphasizing its inherent difficulties and complications. If at the same time he begins to twist his face, frown, bulge his eyes, or rub his physiognomy with a clear expression of displeasure, do not hesitate to send him to hell. You can do it in a polite, literary language. If he doesn't back up and start convincing you that he was attracted to difficult tasks from the cradle, repeat your recommendation in plain language. If the conversation takes place in front of witnesses, then tell him that several other people are applying for this job and that you will inform him of your decision in a day or two. If he manages to get you shaky, say goodbye that he's too good for the job and absentmindedly wish him luck. 100% candidates for a sex walk are those assholes who are interested in their career prospects under your leadership. Drive them away without hesitation, the air will be cleaner. Always end an interview as soon as you gather the right information, whether it's 5 minutes or 5 hours. If the candidate impressed you, check his references and his work history for lice. Forget about the references that the candidate brought you, because only a complete idiot will let you read something that puts him in an unflattering light. If you know someone who has made a recommendation, by all means give them a call. And in general, it is better to receive information from your own people. For those who you like, schedule a second interview, preferably during lunch, and at this meeting pump him through all the contradictions and inconsistencies in the information provided to them. If his answers satisfy you, sell him this work. Moreover, when selling work, do not make any promises. Don't promise raises, career advancement, or empowerment. This is superfluous, the candidate gets what he gets, and nothing more. Moreover, you are not a magician and are not obliged to fulfill other people's desires. Give him the job he was aiming for, and we'll see. Following the job offer, come up with some purely hypothetical problems that your prospective employee might face and ask him to outline his possible actions to resolve them. If his answers suit you, make a final offer and hire him. If not, go back to the office and set up a meeting with the next candidate. Keep in mind that during the second interview, the vast majority of people feel more relaxed than during the first, which means that you can find out the truth about them more easily, especially during a meal together. Behavior at the table can tell a lot about a person. Wine tells everything, they say in Sicily. You are looking for competent specialists, but sometimes, by the ill will of the case, stupid people, suckers and bureaucrats will come to you. Well, if you could recognize such freaks at a glance? And if not? However, do not worry. Every organization has its fair share of morons and bureaucrats, and the blunders they're constantly picking up don't do much damage. Suffice it to recall the United States Postal Service, half of whose employees belong to the above categories, but nevertheless the letters reach their destination. And the fact that the mail is slow is not to blame for the idiots and bureaucrats who flooded this organization that is very necessary for the nation, but for the management, which consists entirely of clowns who are godlessly overpaid. If one of your bureaucrats ends up in shit, eat him alive. 
If he survives, he will continue to go out of his way to meet your expectations. In everyday life, the harm from a bureaucrat is exactly the same as from a blind horse in an empty barn. However, why do you need to hire, promote and sponsor a clown company? You know, sometimes such a person can become one of your most devoted associates. His devotion is based on gratitude for the fact that you do not take away his job and do not drive him away from the feeder, convinced of his incompetence. He will be devoted to you for fear of being thrown out into the street at any moment. He cannot live without you. He constantly needs your support. It exists only because of your indulgence, your patience. Rest assured, this devotion will make him your best informant, your most zealous purveyor of office gossip, rumors, and news. It is implemented in this area and will constantly bring you some dividends. What's bad? Such people look after your interests well, and if necessary, when the situation requires someone's blood, they can be sacrificed without prejudice to the company. Nothing personal, just business. You should never hire representatives, representatives of the opposite sex, counting on erotic rewards later, except in situations related to image or show-off. But, tell me, hand on heart, is a person able to stop on show-off in time? Soldiers and Lieutenants Business is life, and there is always a place for betrayal in it. Therefore, of all personal qualities, we value loyalty first of all and tirelessly cultivate it in our soldiers and lieutenants. But we do not delude ourselves, remembering that the only person whom each of us can fully trust always and in any situation is himself. Others can only be trusted sometimes. Devotion is followed by ability and competence. Promote only capable people, not neglecting the occasional bureaucrat. Only through experience can you find capable people. Test them. They must make their bones and receive new powers from you. Having discovered competence in the chosen persons, give them more and more difficult work, but only one with which they can successfully cope. Do not forget to praise them in order to instill in them self-confidence. Pull them up to more difficult tasks, where you can cut down big bonuses, and then set even more difficult ones. Do not criticize more than necessary, and try not to do it in public. Make it a rule to preface criticism with a few words of praise. Most of your soldiers have only the faintest idea of their own worth, or, frankly, of their own mediocrity. Your duty is to inspire them with the idea that they are at least worth something. It is not necessary to do it personally, it is better to involve your street lieutenants. This is done so that the tasks that you set for them matter to them. They should be willing to take on a task from you and should be proud of themselves when they complete it. They must, and this is the main thing, come to realize the meaning of life through the work they do for you. Therefore, you must praise them both deservedly and sometimes not even deservedly, so that they work for your good. Make it a rule to publicly praise your lieutenants. This will lead them to the idea that they are in authority. Tell your lieutenants that they can handle tasks on their own, but don't let them forget that it's you who hands out the tasks here. Give your lieutenants clear, specific instructions, but never tell them the whole scheme, the whole point. If none of your subordinates knows everything, then they will all depend on you. And lastly, try to make your soldiers and lieutenants your children. Counselor Good advice is thought-provoking. For the role of consigliere, your main advisor, you should choose a person with a lot of life experience, versatile views, and a practical mind. And, of course, you have to trust him. Consigliere is the voice of reason, it is not just an advisor, but also a person from whom one can and should learn. Venaria piu mini consigili, translated, how to become more sane, and the duty of the consigliere to help you with this. He is somewhat distant from your problems, emotions and thoughts, since on does not have your power and your authority. And the responsibility that lies on his shoulders cannot be compared with the one that you bear. But these circumstances help him to always maintain clarity of mind. Being at a distance, your consigliere looks at things a little differently and will be better able to help you decide when making this or that decision. Yes, here's another thing, you can safely charge your consigliere with the resolution of minor disputes within your organization. 
Consigliere will keep you from false conclusions and unjustified decisions, because he is, in a certain sense, a disinterested person. On the one hand, completely interested, but at the same time disinterested, due to the fact that the final responsibility for everything that happens lies not with him, but with you. You can get bad advice from good friends and bad advice from your best friends. On the other hand, the advice given by your consigliere usually turns out to be good. Listen carefully to your consigliere. A good consigliere will make you think and answer questions. Expect his advice to differ from generally accepted worldly postulates, because with his experience, views and acumen, he knows the price of common truths, which are often erroneous. Secretary Your secretary should be your bodyguard, guardian, diplomat, planner, and at the same time depend entirely on your generosity and your location. You are the basis of her financial and psychological well-being. You have to trust your secretary much more than your wife. She is supposed to know everything about your business that you yourself know, of course, except for what you would prefer not to dedicate to her. She will know some aspects of your business better than you, because she is much closer than you are to the sources of office information and the lobby of office politics. For you, there is no better provider of verified and accurate information than your secretary. Never, under any circumstances, ask her to make you coffee. Better follow him to the nearest cafe, ordering two servings so that your secretary can drink a cup with you. The location of your secretary is essential to the success of all your plans. She can destroy you much faster than your competitors or the police if she wants to. Therefore, you must make her happy and you must never spoil your relationship with her. Her hostility is deadly to you. As a boss, give her a resounding title, give her responsibility and give her the appropriate authority, not forgetting a really good salary. Director of Personnel The Mafia has no such position. Think about whether you need him a director of personnel? When your organization grows so large that some people in it begin to prove the need for a director of personnel, remember that as soon as he appears, the heads of your departments will immediately lose close contact with their employees, and this is very dangerous for the organization as a whole. We believe that a manager should form his team personally and only personally. If any of your subordinates, on their own initiative, start looking for personnel, make sure that they only deal with general matters. Never let them write job advertisements or do the initial screening. Also, never let them interview candidates. Remember, managers personally must recruit and hire their people. If you hire 20-year-olds who are supposed to start their careers from the bottom, you can directly say that at first they will have to gear, run errands, do what they say, and university wisdom here is useless to them. Advise them to do their work willingly, with soul, to do it brilliantly. They should shove the feeling of their own super-professionalism in their ass, and deeper, because at this stage of their working biography they will not only not need it, but will also interfere with their duties. Tell them to immediately forget all the brilliant ideas regarding the optimization of operations and expansion of the business, which will visit them from the first day. Explain that these ideas have long been expressed, tested in practice and put aside. Also explain that secretaries and other technical people in your organization can be the most important allies they can have. Advise them not to show off, not to criticize their new colleagues, but on the contrary, try to become part of the team, at least for a while. Insinuate that smart people, who tend to think that most of their workmates are boring, stupid and narrow-minded, do not stay with you for more than a day. To put it simply, advise them to work silently, it helps to get by with less energy consumption and without loss of quality. Our people, those who want to enter our cause, do not need such advice, because, unlike university graduates, we get all the necessary knowledge on the street. Street education is much better than university education, because the street really teaches life, and universities just inspire their students that they know the world. Worst of all, the graduates actually believe it. Accountant Just one person in your organization must be absolutely sincere, absolutely honest, absolutely faithful, absolutely conscientious and absolutely incorruptible. No, we are not talking about the secretary, everything has already been said about her. 
We mean the accountant, the humble, quiet person who manages your company's accounts and your own. Take care of him, appreciate him, blow dust off him. Pay him decently, do not forget to give him rewards more often, in the end, do not skimp on praise if at the moment you do not have the opportunity to offer him something else. If accounting work is enough for two or even more employees, then find an assistant, assistance, for your accountant, sensible, efficient, loving this work. One that will control your accountant, of course, the accountant, in turn, will control him. If such work is not enough for two, then do not forget to involve third-party auditors from time to time to check the accounts of your organization. Remember, you can only trust yourself completely. Titles The watchers say that the working titled boss of all bosses, Capitatuticapi, was only dropped because it aroused jealousy, envy and malice among the heads of the families. All bosses wanted to be equal, and no one was going to give in to the other. Now our bosses live and work according to the principle, one person, one vote. Ponies rule the world. Increases. Develop an annual performance appraisal policy for your employees where performance is measured against a rate multiplied by a percentage of the maximum raise. If an employee deserves it, promote him after certification. Of course, you must separately reward active, persistent, diligent, and dedicated employees, so in special cases you can raise the reward above the established limit at your discretion. But be sure to make sure that when you go over the pay limits set by management, stockholders, creditors, or whatever dark and formidable forces you claim to really control your business, the worker is aware of your personal generosity. Keep in mind that there are people who are never satisfied, no matter how kind life is to them. If such subjects complain to you that they are underpaid, advise them to take part-time work to make ends meet, unless, of course, this will harm the main job. In life and our cause, employees are not usually prevented from doing small business on the side to increase their income. The main thing is that they remember which business is the main one for them, and which one is secondary, and never make sudden gestures without the prior permission of the management. Devotion all people strive to act in their own interests, and most of them believe that they know what these interests are. They are often wrong, but they never doubt their rightness. You must force your employees to see their own interests in your own. You do this by punishing them for their mistakes and rewarding them for their accomplishments. You cultivate loyalty by constantly showing people that their profits are in the same place as yours. The merger of interests is mutual because your people solve the problems that you set them. Be fair in judging their accomplishments. It is likely that the failure of the task you set was due to circumstances that got out of their control, or even your erroneous assessment of the situation, and not the laziness and mediocrity of the performers. Always interpret doubts in favor of the employee until you are about to fire him for incompetence. And never rush to fire a new employee may be worse than the old one. And finally, about the main thing. Even if your soldier is wrong, he is still right, because a little later, the two of you can resolve the situation by eliminating all the stress. Any employee in your organization is always right in relation to an outsider, and you, as a leader, are always right for everyone in your organization. Is always. Types. If human nature does not lead you into a dead end from time to time, then you simply do not understand people. Simplified, all people can be divided into certain elementary types. Under all circumstances, you should avoid only one category of people eloquent windbags, narcissistic speakers whose speech resembles machine gun fire. You should not be interested in the beauty and imagery of the rhetoric of your captains, lieutenants and soldiers. You are only interested in the results because they speak for themselves. There are many basic types that are unlikely to interest you, unless, of course, they have special skills for special assignments, after which they can be easily disposed of. Fire, strangle, shoot, drown, recommend as a daily employee to your worst enemy. Here are examples of such types, winner, gossip, thug, bull. The bottom line is that you should not give work to humanoids with whom it is difficult for you to communicate, or those whose hairstyle annoys you. This is one of the perks of being a manager. Put it on your nose that, in the first place, no one hires anyone except for the purpose of cashing in on what that person can do. 
nobody, and no one. Secondly, there are always at least a few people who can do the same thing, all other things being equal. In other words, you always have a choice. There is no need to mess with assholes who will complicate your activities, and this rule is good not only for work, but also for personal life too. Do you have employees who are prone to frequent bouts of irritation, hypochondriacs, red tape, idle talkers? Get rid of them immediately. It will be better for you and maybe even for them. After that, take a closer look at your people to determine which type of soldier they belong to. There are four types of soldiers in any organization. Here they are. 1. Dumb and lazy, in the sense, without ambition. 2. Intelligent and lazy. 3. Dumb and ambitious. 4. Intelligent and ambitious. The first type, dumb and lazy, usually doesn't know if he should shave his butt and scratch his chin, or if he should do the opposite. This type includes hard workers, bureaucrats, talkers, and many others. Sometimes it will seem to you that three quarters of your soldiers are like that, but in fact, the proportion of stupid and lazy in any company rarely exceeds half, averaging 25 to 30 percent. Given simple and clear orders, bureaucrats will be able to cope fairly well with daily routine tasks, being satisfied with purely symbolic salary increases. In addition, they will belong to the number of your most devoted employees. After all, every shit has its use, for lack of a better one. For the good of your organization, you should try to recruit soldiers of the second type, intelligent and lazy. These people will not spend a penny to watch an ant stack a haystack, but they can easily find a needle in a haystack if they need it. Therefore, they need to be constantly kicked, driven, stabbed in the ass with an awl, and then they will do the job. You just have to make sure that your lieutenants stimulate them in a timely manner. These workers, intelligent and lazy, will shovel the bulk of the routine work at the top level of your organization. Many managers mistakenly consider smart and lazy people to be unsuitable employees and avoid both hiring and working with them in every possible way. They do not understand that they only need a long, strong stick to systematically motivate such subordinates. Oddly enough, or perhaps not at all strange, all consigliere are usually of the second type. He has no impulses and motives, no, figuratively speaking, no inner spark to turn his mind into personal power, but he has enough mind to be an excellent advisor. People of the third type, dumb and ambitious, are easily recognizable by their habit of constantly flattering. Such subjects believe that any shit can be given a strawberry flavor, and in this they differ from normal people. Of course, this type of people can be useful to you, because they are ready for anything, just to suck up to you. The dumb and ambitious make the best errand boys, adjutants, sixes, and errands. Their usefulness ends where ambition meets their stupidity. Not only will they not be able to work under strong, capable lieutenants, but they will not be able to subjugate others because of their arrogance spilling over the edge. They crave to control, manage, command, but for this they do not have enough opportunities, or, more simply, the mind. In addition, because of the need to flatter, they do not have real loyalty. This is not surprising, because most people with ambition do not have loyalty, as they dream of taking the place of their leader. Aren't you like that? Alas, the dumb and ambitious do not have a sense of place and time that helps to take the right step on the path to happiness, without interfering with the activities of the organization. The very first problem created by this type shows his true face to the world. Be on the lookout, the dumb and ambitious, as well as the dumb and lazy, against the background of inner stupidity, cunning can wake up. The Germans call such freaks dumb slow, stupid clever. Such soldiers are extremely dangerous for the organization and they must be ruthlessly brought down at the first opportunity, otherwise sooner or later they will betray you. If luck smiles at you, then your Dumschlau, who is sorely lacking in intelligence, will make a mistake on small mistakes, and you, remembering the principle lie in one lie in everything, will immediately take appropriate measures. The fourth and last type is intelligent and ambitious. This type of employee needs to be given more and more difficult tasks, rewarding and promoting him in case of success. People belonging to this type are different, stubborn, quiet, enthusiastic, apathetic, gloomy, friendly, in short really anyone, 
but they are the ones who bring success to your organization. Most people are a mixture of all of these types, and it is very rare to find a pure representative of any type. Of course, you would like to surround yourself with loyal, honest, open, talented, brave, active, and calm people. You would like your people to keep their personal egos in check, doing their job quietly, without self-promotion. You would like your people to put the goals of the organization ahead of their own. You would like your people not to strive for power, but to dispose of it wisely, being authorized by you. Alas, such righteous people do not exist, the world is imperfect, and the people who inhabit it are also far from perfect. But do not despair, look for a semblance of perfection, people who are closer than the rest to the ideal. By advancing them up the corporate ladder, you can easily find out everything about them, because power manifests a person, at the same time spoiling him. It inflates in him a sense of self-worth and reduces the level of self-control. Happy are those few who can stand the test of power with honor, such as you, for example. Leadership An old Sicilian proverb states that no woman can give a man, and vice versa, as much pleasure as power over her own kind can give. It's probably true. Mankind has tried many different ways to command and has come to the conclusion that issuing orders is the most efficient, most effective, and, of course, the most reliable. When managing people, success is measured not by the quality and nature of your relationship with subordinates, but by the achievement of the intended goals. Do not relax the lads, and even more so do not relax yourself. Before setting a task, collect all the information about the situation and about those who will resolve it. Give orders and instructions in clear, understandable words, and set only achievable goals for subordinates. At the same time, do not be verbose, hold back the fountain of your eloquence, because the fewer orders, the better for business. When talking to people, be clear about what you want to get from them. Answer your guys' questions until their mission is crystal clear. And never apologize to your people, however, as well as to your women. Avoid familiarity in dealing with your subordinates. Familiarity arouses admiration, but breeds suspicion. Never form an alliance against bosses with their underlings. Know that the day will come when the bosses will bring their subordinates closer, and they, wagging their tails with happiness, will prove their loyalty by handing you over with giblets. Or they will betray you for fear of being exposed, but they will betray you all the same, do not hesitate. Even the most disenfranchised soldiers of your family have power over someone. To make them give all their best, turn inside out from zeal, tear their veins in a fit of labor enthusiasm, show your respect for them, but do not forget that they are not dons, and most importantly, do not let them forget it. Regardless of the actual qualities of your employees, you must always inspire them that they are the best of the best and can become even better. Praise them when the goal is reached, but don't do it too often. Intending to subject the guilty to public execution, criticize them in general, without getting personal. Remember that there are people standing in front of you and sweating with fear who will have to fight for you. So don't humiliate them. And do not forget the folk wisdom that says that you can't spoil porridge with butter. However, keep in mind that overly good rulers are sooner or later overthrown by rebellious subjects. Most people perceive kindness as a sign of weakness. Be firm and even sometimes cruel so that your guys joyfully and thoroughly follow your orders. People respect strength. This is doubly true for women, because more often than not, their fathers were for them the embodiment of brute power. Most little girls continue to love and respect their fathers even as adults. Make them transfer some of that respect to you. Use it. Become a strict father to the women on your team and they will lay down their bones just to please you. Be ready to betray any of your people, especially those you trust more than others. Repay the betrayal as soon as possible and, if possible, publicly. You will die as a man, or only as a boss, if you leave even one betrayal unpunished. If you become aware that one of your soldiers or lieutenants has some kind of domestic problem, adultery, a nymphomaniac wife, a kleptomaniac daughter, or an alcoholic son, keep a close eye on them. People with such problems are unreliable, easily pissed off, and besides, the apple always falls near the apple tree. 
Most successful managers speak quietly, calmly, and in a measured manner. This is right, because not loud, but quiet speech makes others listen. Develop this quality in yourself and remember, the more you talk, the less they listen to you. Sometimes you have to be harsh and even rude with your subordinates. Don't worry about what people say or think badly about you. They already think and talk badly about you. But more often still try to be polite and sensitive with people. Please the majority, crush the minority. Smile. Spread compliments and exude honey and oil. As far as possible, try to be honest. Tell the truth about your plans in that part of them that is needed to complete the tasks you have set or keep quiet. Make subordinates believe that you are a man of your word. Harry Khan, the hated czar of the film industry, was admired for his ability to keep his word. Promising to destroy a man, he always kept his promise. Be consistent, except on those rare occasions when inconsistency is necessary to give a good shakeup to complacency and blissful employees and destroy their complacency and self-satisfaction. If you are at the top, then all your words and deeds will be perceived by your subordinates as something of genius. In any case, they will tell you so. The most interesting thing is that the majority will not prevaricate. For them, any stupidity that comes out of your mouth will become the sublime truth, the ultimate truth, just because you are the boss. Therefore, never be greedy for flattery, especially when it comes to your subordinates. Look at your people. Watch their reaction to your words. Know who supports you, who opposes you, and who makes alliances with whom. As the saying goes, without knowing the reefs, you can't swim calmly. There will always be factions, factions, cliques, alliances among your personnel. Your task is to ensure that their struggle with each other does not interfere with the achievement of the goals of your organization. Information is vital for any leader, and office gossip is much more informative than formal reports. However, there are many things that you shouldn't show knowledge about, because it's much easier to pretend to be formally ignorant than to enter into a gang war. Over time, everything will settle down. Patience resolves conflicts. The best way out is to take into account as few of these problems as possible. After all, you do not care about the undercover fuss of your employees. You need a team game from them. Of course, you want your soldiers to fight for your every look and for your smallest favor. Arrange so that they know that your look and your grace they can receive as a result of productive work. From their office rivalry, you will benefit greatly by increasing the productivity and effectiveness of the entire team as a whole. If you have a group in your company that is constantly producing high results, coping with any task, never, under any circumstances, break it up. You will ruin. If you are riding a fast, full of strength horse, there is no need for you to dismount and lead him at a walk ride him while he's alive. On the other hand, don't forget to move your employees from task to task, from group to group. If you do not do this, people will become covered with moss, stop thinking, stop straining. They will be interested in only one thing, how to calmly digest your budget. Assign troublemakers in your team impossible tasks. Let them manifest or destroy themselves. If you're giving one of your teams a spanking, be even and calm with the other teams until it's their turn. Encourage initiative. If the situation permits, assign a task to the person who volunteers to complete it. In most cases, this is the best way to achieve success. In addition, this way you can discover promising employees that you overlooked during the hiring. If you need to assign a task to one person, set it only to him. Try not to pit two people against each other in solving the same problem, as most consulting firms advise. These snickering assholes who call themselves consultants think that playing people off helps get the job done and also helps them figure out who's the best. We are more inclined to trust Napoleon, who once remarked that one bad general is much better than two good ones. So entrust the case for one-to-one. -one. Explain to him the goals, empower him, allow him to choose means and methods, subject to deadlines and goals. Judge by results, not by promises. Resolving conflicts within a team. You hire a person with the skills and abilities you need. 
About a month later, your old co-worker shows up to complain about him. Determine for yourself their value to the organization and compare it in order to get rid of the less valuable in case of insoluble contradictions. If they are of equal value, tell the complainer the story of the man who brought the monkey into the house to get rid of dirty work. The wife said he was crazy. Why do we need a monkey in the house? Where will she sleep? Yelled the wife. With us. With us? What about the stink? She'll get used to it. This parable will save you the need for further discussions, but if the complainer does not smile, but stands his ground, get rid of him if you do not want further problems. Dismissal. In the good old days, one phrase was enough, we no longer need your services. At the time of dismissal, then it was not necessary to explain their motives. Today everything has become more difficult. Dismiss Sue for illegal and unfair dismissal. The courts are guided by the concept of the right to work, which means the impossibility of dismissal without any violations on the part of the worker. If you decide to get rid of someone, start documenting their incompetence in writing so that if you file a lawsuit, you can justify their dismissal in court. When preparing the dismissal, send out a memorandum to everyone possible about the inconsistency of the employee with the position he occupies and make sure that all the right people, including the candidate for dismissal himself, receive a copy. After all, according to the law, you cannot be fired for incompetence without prior warning. Therefore, it is not out of place to precede a kick in the ass with the announcement of a probationary period and a warning about incomplete official compliance, after which no one can say that you suddenly fired a valuable employee. At the end of your probationary period, no matter how long it lasts, you open the doors wide and whisper affectionately, get the hell out, get out, or goodbye. It is very easy, and much more effective, to get rid of an unwanted frame with the help of aggression and humiliation. Harsh, not necessarily justified and prolonged public criticism, combined with degrading orders and tasks, the order to wipe puddles after your beloved kitten will be just right, should quickly force the average person to voluntary dismissal. If none of these methods worked, you can invite the victim to your office for a personal conversation and talk with him on personal topics. If you manage, then your interlocutor will leave your office trembling with fear and immediately upon leaving will write a letter asking for his dismissal and will be glad that he got off cheaply. In our cause, those whose departure would be a problem are removed without question. Theft. Some of your people intend to rob you. Such is human nature. There are goats who believe that taking away paper, paper clips, scissors, pans, pencils, stamps, and other office supplies from the office increases job satisfaction, increases productivity, and improves the company's economy. Therefore, do not think of weeping when you discover a few petty thieves in your organization, but henceforth try not to lose sight of them, remembering that under the right circumstances, a small thief, encouraged by success, may try to become a big one. When you catch a big thief, wipe him out in public. Precisely publicly, since no better means of preventing crime has been invented than the introduction into the minds of the people of the belief in the inevitability of cruel retribution. Tightening your belts. If your organization has to tighten its belts, it means that you and your people have allowed themselves to relax. Cost reduction start with yourself, in this case it will be easier for your employees to make certain sacrifices. Cut your pay, cut your perks, forego bonuses, and leak the accounting information appropriately so that your great sacrifices happen to be known to the whole team. Belt tightening is best started with a personal audit of the entire organization. Then violently end the extravagance and start downsizing. Consolidate some posts, destroy others, transfer others to the category of temporary and seasonal ones. Personally keep a strict record and control of all expenses, up to the cost of buying paper and paper clips. Draw up a step-by-step -step program for overcoming the crisis and carry it out with admirable fanaticism. Post this program, leaving out what everyone doesn't need to know, in front of everyone so that your employees know it, remember it, and can be infected by your enthusiasm for total cost and resource savings. And, of course, make sure that each employee has thoroughly studied and understood their role in your program, because there is no one to look after this except you. Productivity 
Increased productivity is not always directly related to working fast or staying up late at night in the office. Statisticians say that 50% of working time is used inefficiently. In other words, your guys are chasing a bullshit, making a roly-poly, beating pairs, or simply taking a nap for 30 minutes out of every hour. The productivity of your company can be increased by various measures. Among them, control over the planning of the working hours of employees, of course, with a full understanding of the goals of their work, studying the weekly reports of your guys, combined with the deployment of a large-scale campaign to distribute kicks and slaps, and much more. When increasing the productivity of your subordinates, do not forget that no engine has 100% efficiency, just like a person. If your people work too hard, then one of two things either they are trying to impress you, or they do not cope with their tasks during working hours. Decide, pick a reason. Most likely, you will find that your middle managers are trying to maximize their income by overloading their subordinates without measure. This can lead to a backfire phenomenon, usually ending in an engine explosion that hurts everyone, including you. Try not to encourage overtime. Impress your people that the best way to impress you is to demonstrate the results of your work in time and go home to get high and relax. Concepts Your organization needs written rules and detailed guidelines for spending. In all other respects, the fewer rules, the better. Each rule is just a fairly contentious boundary that many people are willing to cross. Keep in mind that adventurers who tend to break the rules may be your best employees. Axioms Better a donkey that carries it than a horse that throws off its rider. In the fertile land of promises, it's easy to starve to death. The fish is killed by its own mouth, open to a baited hook. You can't judge a book by its cover, unless the cover is all it has. The true nature of the business. The essence of our cause, the basis of its foundations, is to make money. Anyway, without hesitation. This also applies to you. Of course, within the bounds of your law-abiding. As the great Al Capone so aptly put it in Shaggy 1926, like any businessman, I'm just supplying an existing demand. In the legal business world, it's not illegal to swindle consumers, unless, of course, you're caught and exposed. Rip off your clients like a sticky, lie to them three boxes, rob them, cheat around your finger, take the last from widows and children, scam real estate, speculate in inflated stocks, do not pay your bills, but always put debtors on the counter, look for new opportunities for enrichment. But, do not get caught. Never get caught. Throw away false idealistic ideas about the business world that prevent you from achieving success. In any organization, at any time, be it times of peace or war, the complete absence of such concepts as conscience and nobility gives a huge advantage. Capitalism As Big Al wrote in 1929, our American system, let's call it Americanism, let's call it capitalism, call it whatever you like, gives each of us a great chance and a great opportunity only if we grasp it with both hands and we squeeze out of it as much as we can. If Al Capone is no authority for you, then read the opinion of another well-known figure from the legal world, one Abraham Lincoln, expressed in 1837, basically, these capitalists act harmoniously and harmoniously, like an orchestra during a concert, to cut the audience's hair. Cutting the public is the goal of any business, although it is usually expressed in a less direct way. But who dares argue with Lincoln? At its core, the goal of capitalism is the further enrichment of people who already have money to invest, in other words, the further enrichment of the rich. No wonder the offspring of rich parents are so reverent about their dads, who leave them jackpot as a legacy, Alibaba's treasures, Captain Flint's treasure, a dimensionless wallet, tons of dough, etc. After all, being rich is much better and more pleasant than being poor. Our people adore capitalism. We are generally super cool guys, believe me. Don't be afraid of us until you owe us. Rich. The impartial law forbids both the rich and the poor to sleep on park benches. In all other respects, the rich have an advantage. No wonder they say that money does not sit in jail. You cannot become rich without knowing how to gain influence. You can't be powerful without a fortune. 
The vast majority of the wealthy inherited their fortunes along with the belief that their property was a gift from God. They grew up with an unreasonable, but at the same time deep and persistent conviction of their own superiority over others. They have no disposition and sympathy for those who own a smaller piece than they do. They believe that poverty, just like wealth, is given by God and is given according to merit, which means that everyone who is less than they are complete idiots. Hereditary rich people make interesting partners and even more interesting competitors. Usually, the thought that we can deceive, rob, cheat, cheat them cannot come into gilded heads. There is a saying in Sicily, you can shear a sheep regularly, but you can only skin it once. But the rich are strange creatures, they can be skinned as often as they can be sheared. If you run into a team led by a hereditary rich guy who was born with a golden spoon in his mouth and a silver all in his ass, you must consider that he is not like your usual opponents and should be communicated differently. Keep in mind that in difficult situations, such a rich man most often resembles an ice cream block driven into a corner by kicks. These guys are useless fighters, they even do boxing by correspondence. Kapisai? 17. But remember that the most profitable business is the one that cuts the hair of the poor, not the oligarchs. Why? Yes, because there are much more poor people, which means that much more can be cut off from them. Take an example from such firms as Firestone, Ford, General Motors, DuPont, Union Carbide. Competitive Fight You will fight two eternal battles with competitors, one with internal ones, the other with external ones. Feel free to match. You are in the case, compare, 18, and if you are in the case, it means that you cannot get out of it. In both cases, you are fighting for power, not money. Money is secondary, it is a derivative of power. In both cases, you need a win, just one win, only a win and nothing but a win. Let's listen to Karl von Clausewitz, an outstanding German military theorist. Some good-hearted people may think that there is some ingenious way to disarm or defeat the enemy without bloodshed, and this is what the art of war should strive for. Pleasant as this sophism sounds, it must be refuted, wars are a dangerous occupation in which the most deadly mistakes come from kindness. He also said, combat is the only effective way to wage war, its purpose is the destruction of enemy forces as a means of ending the conflict. The destruction of enemy forces is at the heart of all military action, all military plans are based on this absolute truth. Here is Machiavelli's advice on the same subject, there are two ways to win one through the law. The other is through brute force. The former is used by humans and the latter by animals, and when the first is exhausted, it is necessary to turn to the second. Aggressive animal behavior aimed at the complete, total, final destruction of the enemy is the price that must be paid for success. Are you not ready for this? Is something bothering you? Do you remember morality? Calm down. Know that kindness and compassion are not able to cover the floor of your office with Persian carpets. However, if you crave love, forget about business and get yourself a terrier or, for example, a spaniel. Sadavos, 19, there is another secret you should know about. It is impossible to be noble, virtuous and correct in the struggle for power. Your external and internal enemies are alien to virtue in their attempts to topple and trample you. In the struggle for power, your calculation should be based solely on self-interest, combined with the direct and most effective way to achieve your goals. The more brutal and destructive you act, the worse it is for your enemies. The true nature of the business. The essence of our cause, the basis of its foundations, is to make money. Anyway, without hesitation. This also applies to you. Of course, within the bounds of your law-abiding, as the great Al Capone so aptly put it in Shaggy 1926, like any businessman, I'm just supplying an existing demand. In the legal business world, it's not illegal to swindle consumers, unless, of course, you're caught and exposed. Rip off your clients like a sticky, lie to them three boxes, rob them, cheat around your finger, take the last from widows and children, scam real estate, speculate in inflated stocks, do not pay your bills, but always put debtors on the counter, look for new opportunities for enrichment. 
but do not get caught. Never get caught. Throw away false idealistic ideas about the business world that prevent you from achieving success. In any organization, at any time, be it times of peace or war, the complete absence of such concepts as conscience and nobility gives a huge advantage. Capitalism. As Big Al wrote in 1929, our American system, let's call it Americanism, let's call it capitalism, call it whatever you like, gives each of us a great chance and a great opportunity only if we grasp it with both hands and we squeeze out of it as much as we can. If Al Capone is no authority for you, then read the opinion of another well-known figure from the legal world, one Abraham Lincoln, expressed in 1837, basically, these capitalists act harmoniously and harmoniously, like an orchestra during a concert, to cut the audience's hair. Cutting the public is the goal of any business, although it is usually expressed in a less direct way. But who dares argue with Lincoln? At its core, the goal of capitalism is the further enrichment of people who already have money to invest, in other words, the further enrichment of the rich. No wonder the offspring of rich parents are so reverent about their dads, who leave them jackpot as a legacy, Alibaba's treasures, Captain Flint's treasure, a dimensionless wallet, tons of dough, etc. After all, being rich is much better and more pleasant than being poor. Our people adore capitalism. We are generally super cool guys, believe me. Don't be afraid of us until you owe us. Rich. The impartial law forbids both the rich and the poor to sleep on park benches. In all other respects, the rich have an advantage. No wonder they say that money does not sit in jail. You cannot become rich without knowing how to gain influence. You can't be powerful without a fortune. The vast majority of the wealthy inherited their fortunes along with the belief that their property was a gift from God. They grew up with an unreasonable but at the same time deep and persistent conviction of their own superiority over others. They have no disposition and sympathy for those who own a smaller piece than they do. They believe that poverty, just like wealth, is given by God and is given according to merit, which means that everyone who is less than they are complete idiots. Hereditary rich people make interesting partners and even more interesting competitors. Usually, the thought that we can deceive, rob, cheat, cheat them cannot come into gilded heads. There is a saying in Sicily, you can shear a sheep regularly, but you can only skin it once. But the rich are strange creatures, they can be skinned as often as they can be sheared. If you run into a team led by a hereditary rich guy who was born with a golden spoon in his mouth and a silver all in his ass, you must consider that he is not like your usual opponents and should be communicated differently. Keep in mind that in difficult situations, such a rich man most often resembles an ice cream block, driven into a corner by kicks. These guys are useless fighters, they even do boxing by correspondence. Kapisai? 17. But remember that the most profitable business is the one that cuts the hair of the poor, not the oligarchs. Why? Yes, because there are much more poor people, which means that much more can be cut off from them. Take an example from such firms as Firestone, Ford, General Motors, DuPont, Union Carbide. Competitive Fight You will fight two eternal battles with competitors, one with internal ones, the other with external ones. Feel free to match. You are in the case, compare, 18, and if you are in the case, it means that you cannot get out of it. In both cases, you are fighting for power, not money. Money is secondary, it is a derivative of power. In both cases, you need a win, just one win, only a win and nothing but a win. Let's listen to Karl von Clausewitz, an outstanding German military theorist. Some good-hearted people may think that there is some ingenious way to disarm or defeat the enemy without bloodshed, and this is what the art of war should strive for. Pleasant as this sophism sounds, it must be refuted, wars are a dangerous occupation in which the most deadly mistakes come from kindness. He also said, combat is the only effective way to wage war, its purpose is the destruction of enemy forces as a means of ending the conflict. The destruction of enemy forces is at the heart of all military action, all military plans are based on this absolute truth. Here is Machiavelli's advice on the same subject, there are two ways to win. 
one through the law. The other is through brute force. The former is used by humans and the latter by animals, and when the first is exhausted, it is necessary to turn to the second. Aggressive animal behavior aimed at the complete, total, final destruction of the enemy is the price that must be paid for success. Are you not ready for this? Is something bothering you? Do you remember morality? Calm down. Know that kindness and compassion are not able to cover the floor of your office with Persian carpets. However, if you crave love, forget about business and get yourself a terrier or, for example, a spaniel. Sadavos, 19, there is another secret you should know about. It is impossible to be noble, virtuous and correct in the struggle for power. Your external and internal enemies are alien to virtue in their attempts to topple and trample you. In the struggle for power, your calculation should be based solely on self-interest, combined with the direct and most effective way to achieve your goals. The more brutal and destructive you act, the worse it is for your enemies. What you think is right may seem wrong to outside critics, but you don't need to listen to them. Ramming forward, listening only to yourself. This is what the principle you do what you have to do teaches, with an emphasis on the second you. Before each encounter in your war, you must correctly calculate and represent the allowable losses. Act on time, do not slow down. Remember the military axiom, there is no need to send reinforcements if the battle is already lost. And don't forget the wise rule of poker, don't marry a bad hand. The winner is not the one who won the most battles. The winner is the one who won the most money, who won the war. With your actions, you must bring your enemies off balance. Act outside the box, when by deceit, and when by force. Make sure that your enemies are afraid of you and this will be your main advantage. Hit hard, hit suddenly, hit for sure. And constantly bluff, confuse the enemies of the head. If possible, let your opponent do as much of your work as possible. If he can be arranged in such a way that he thinks that he will benefit from actions that will trap him and destroy him, so be it. Let the enemy work for you and against himself. You have to lie, lie without hesitation. Disinformation is a glorious weapon. As we have already said, there is no place for morality in the struggle for power. Your absolute goal, sacred task, is the complete destruction of competitors, but, unfortunately, this is not always possible, and sometimes undesirable. Sometimes after the victory you have to make peace with competitors. It is not simple. To conclude a profitable and lasting peace, you should single out those enemies who are capable of revenge and deal with them so that they can never interfere with you again. Deal with them completely and then make peace. It is quite possible that some of the vanquished, not brilliant in mind, will be filled with gratitude to you for ending the war. They, humble and humiliated, can voluntarily make concessions that you could not even dream of. Use it. Beware of two consequences of victory. One, euphoria that interferes with the preparation of sober plans for the future, and generally sober, balanced actions. Two, the corrupting action of the additional power acquired by you, the feeling of impunity born of your elevation. You must take a sober look at things. Negotiation. Dragging out the negotiations indefinitely, as long as there is even the slightest chance of winning. Your opponent can simply get tired and make concessions. Patience is the key to victory. Avoid making eye contact with your opponent during negotiations. Most people perceive this view as a threat. Dogs, by the way, too. If you were taken by the gills or simply caught in a lie, change the subject of the conversation. Use whatever arguments you can think of and do it consistently. So you will not only exhaust your opponent, but you will also be able to find a bunch of holes in his defense. Always play against the player, not the hand. In other words, no matter how reliable and strong the position of your opponent, layout, you must build your game taking into account his individual personal qualities. Under no circumstances show your cards. Even Machiavelli taught, never show your intentions, realize them in all possible ways. 
Ask a man for a weapon without explaining to him your desire to kill him, when it is in your hands, carry out what is intended with this weapon. Start with big stakes and never lower them. It will cost more. Don't be petty. Sacrifice little to gain everything. Do not put the enemy in a hopeless position, avoid driving him into a corner. The main rule of successful negotiations is to give the enemy the opportunity to save face, that is, to leave him at least one way out. After all, you already got everything you wanted from him. Why create unnecessary problems for yourself? Never miss an opportunity to knock out a few profitable concessions from the opposite side, but rarely go for them yourself. Never threaten. Remember the words of Machiavelli, never threaten your enemy and do not insult him, since neither one nor the other will reduce his strength, the former will make him more cautious, the latter will increase his hatred and make him more insistent in seeking to harm you. Got it? Thank God for making human nature so predictable. Know it, and all your negotiations, and not only negotiations, but all business transactions in general, will become simple, easy, and effective. Greed and fear drive people, just like that and no other way. Meetings All meetings, with the exception of the most important summit meetings, should be held standing and appointed at the end of the working day in order to take as little time as possible. When presiding over a meeting, allow everyone to speak only on business. Avoid empty talk. Put out the talkers without delay. The meeting is considered completed as soon as its participants begin to repeat. Have your secretary take transcripts of all meetings you attend and send transcripts to those who have made any commitments or have to do something. Also, your secretary needs to know when she needs to submit these notes to you for analysis. Memorandum 99 out of 100 written memos do not contain information worthy of attention. 50% of the rest can be halved without damage. Make it a rule not to write about anything that goes beyond the well-known. Try never to write really confidential papers. Don't make it easy for your accuser in court. Suppliers Make your employees change suppliers more often. Long-term relationships for the purchase of goods and services discourage suppliers, plunge them into pride, and lead you to addiction and unnecessary costs. Your firm will benefit from the lower prices that new suppliers will be forced to accept in order to intercept the order. Do your best to keep your people from the temptation to make a nice kickback deal for yourself. Teach them that rat mongering will be detrimental to their health and well-being. Explain to them that their precious one and only life is worth much more than the biggest kickback. Liars A real liar always looks straight into the eyes and speaks in a calm and even voice. Don't expect to find in a liar a manifestation of Pinocchio syndrome, which is characterized by rapid blinking, redness of the skin, stuttering, and convulsive swallowing of air. Good liars are sociopaths, 20, people who have no idea of conscience. What's the point of testing them on a lie detector, a polygraph, or a voice stress analyzer? On these worthless devices, simple-minded emotional little people who speak the pure truth, but not born liars, can fall down. By the way, keep in mind that anger and irritation, calling for the vibrations of the recorder, can be erroneously interpreted by the instruments as a lie. Recruitment through polygraph tests is a fashionable but useless undertaking. This practice is not effective in internal investigations either. There are pathological liars who maniacally pervert or distort the truth. Sooner or later they will inevitably reveal themselves, the question is how long it will take. Beware of people who talk too much. Speech incontinence is one of the hallmarks of a manic liar. A good liar can have both an innate gift and an art honed over the years of his life, and sometimes both at the same time. A skillful liar is a versatile person, he can lie both using homemade preparations and spontaneously, however, he will never forget to mix a bit of truth into a lie for greater persuasiveness. If you want to learn how to lie well, or accurately recognize liars, be sure to look at the leading figures of lies statesmen, politicians, lawyers, salesmen, and some children. Do not lose sight of advertising and pay attention not only to deliberately false, unsupported statements, but also to thoughtful omissions. Always assume that your interlocutor is lying, 
and you will not be deceived. And do not forget about the eternal question, who benefits from this? Secrecy. Someday all the secret becomes clear. No one can keep secrets forever, be it people, corporations, or even governments. People chat with each other at work, on the subway, in the elevator, at the bar, at the hairdresser, in bed, and even in their sleep. As a result of this careless and irresponsible chatter, your company's strictest secrets will come to the surface, and it will cost you a lot of money. There are other ways to reveal secrets. And sometimes, they don't need to be revealed. Doesn't it happen that corporate secrets lie in plain sight on bulletin boards, on a photocopier, on scraps of paper, in a wastebasket, or in a folder carelessly forgotten in the toilet? Of course, information leakage cannot be completely prevented, but here are some tips on how to reduce losses. Do not tell anything important to your wife, husband, or mistress. Half of married couples end up in divorce. Lovers also rarely spend their whole lives together. And it is unlikely that any malice can be compared with the malice of a former wife or former lover, hungry for righteous retribution. Don't tell your children anything. Don't tell anyone more than they need to know. Do not make many duplicate keys for safes, but keep the duplicates made in your pocket and put it under your pillow before going to bed. Avoid having business conversations in public places. Get a good shredder and use it all the time, remember cleaners are unreliable, and a manually torn document is easy to recover. Be sure to get your employees to sign a non-disclosure agreement that obliges them not to leak information to competitors. In most countries and in most cases, these contracts will not be legally binding, but they will be a deterrent nonetheless. In recent years, the number of trade secret lawsuits filed by employers against former employees has been on the rise. In such cases, it is important to make the proceedings as public as possible in order to prevent similar leaks in the future. Have a safe equipped with a combination lock. Do not use your birthday, your car number, or the birthdays of your loved ones as a code. Do not use simple combinations. And change the combination more often, by no means doing it at regular, easily calculated and predictable intervals. Do not give too much information to business partners. All people are not averse to gossip, and the smart analysts of your competitors, like paleontologists, will be able to assemble the skeleton of a big secret from the smallest fragmentary fragments. Organize permanent surveillance of those who appear in your office for maintenance, cleaning, and delivery. This is a classic method of infiltrating infiltrated Cossacks, and any of your enemies can resort to it. If you can't pinpoint the source of your regular leaks, you'll need to hire a private detective to fix the problem for good. Do not betray your suspicions in any way, let the agents of the enemy consider themselves safe. Hire the best detective you can find. It will detect eavesdropping devices, help create an environment protected from outside penetration, identify traitors in your company, if they exist, of course, and mark the circle of your external enemies. Yes, the services of a professional, or even professionals, will cost you a pretty penny, but these expenses will pay off handsomely. Don't forget that you are at war. Alternatively, you can allow enemy agents to continue their activities and leak false information to them. Yes, one more thing, you must be sure that the information that one of the lieutenants in charge of your spy network collects for you will not lead him to the idea of starting to weave intrigues in his own interests. An example to follow. Mafia soldiers believe in honor, revenge, and solidarity. The true embodiment of these qualities in our cause was and remains Johnny Torrio. Herbert Osbury, the most authoritative expert on the Chicago underworld, described it this way, no one has succeeded in surpassing Johnny Torrio as an organizer and administrator of the underworld in the annals of American crime. He came closer to the status of the secret leader of the nation, its manipulator, its gray eminence, more than others. First of all, Johnny Torrio was Uomoti Panza, literally, man of the stomach, that is, a man who knows how to store his knowledge in himself, in his stomach, Uomoti Esegrito, man of mystery, who knows how to keep his affairs in the shadows, Uomoti Pazienza, man of patience, who knows how to wait and avoid hasty actions. A person who has patience can control any situation. He is firm, 
he is constant, he is unshakable. He eschews the world. There is no boasting, show-off, and trickery in it. His inner strength gives him significance. He is able to wait for a convenient moment when success is most likely, and only then does he act. He remembers everything that is necessary and learns from the mistakes of others. He is waiting. He exploits the weaknesses of his enemies. He knows that support, 21, is achieved by knowledge of reality, wisdom, sobriety, mind and will, and not by kindness and nobility. His whole life consists of work and self-sacrifice, self-improvement, self-sufficiency, and self-control. He does not look for conflicts, on the contrary, he avoids them whenever possible, except in special cases when it comes to big gains. In other words, he maneuvers, moving towards the intended goal. He is cunning as a fox. He knows how much and what for, and others respect him for it. All of these qualities underlie the concept of being a man, and all these qualities, coupled with a clear and tenacious mind, possess Johnny Torrio. He learned from his little mistakes in Chicago. The genius of Torrio and his authority among his associates allowed him in a short time to create the Mafia as a nationwide organization, and become the de facto consigliere of the syndicate. Looking at this great man, it was impossible to imagine that at the age of seven he was hurting his father's blind pig in Brooklyn. Imitate Johnny Torrio, study his experience, and you will succeed in all your endeavors. Yes, Johnny is less famous than Al Capone, but he was a much more successful leader. House underscore. What does your marriage have to do with your business? All or nothing, depending on your foresight, mind and experience. It is best that the business has nothing to do with marriage. If you can't do it, get your lawyers involved. Before assuming marital fetters, get the right lawyer a leading figure in divorces and marriage contracts. Have him draw up a detailed marriage contract that clearly defines the share of each spouse in the event of a divorce, the probability of which is quite high. A small, agreed-upon compensation will keep your wife and her greedy gang of lawyers at a distance from your business, your property, and your bank accounts. When the woman you love asks, can you really be so insensitive and materialistic as to ask me to sign this contract? I guess you don't love me? Tell her, of course, dear, I love you. But my partners, creditors and lawyers insist on this contract, leaving me no choice. Please make sure you sign all seven copies. Mafia marriages, of course, cannot be an equal deal. According to our concepts, the wife should not know anything about the affairs of her husband. She may, of course, with his permission, have an idea of the size of her husband's income, may know some of his business partners, and can never expect that family problems can rise above business. You can say that you are in a legal business and therefore your marriage will be completely different. Maybe. But still, in order to save your career from unnecessary shocks, we recommend that your wife, like our wives, believe that whatever you do is done for the good of the family, so that she lives in your mind and unquestioningly does what you command. There is no happiness in a house where a hen crows and a rooster sits on a perch trying to lay an egg. Your spouse has no right to be interested in where you were, what you did and what you think. A wife should only know what you think fit to tell her, and should be trained to be content with that. A good wife never shows aggression and does not show discontent. German Kaiser Wilhelm II clearly defined the scope of good wives, Kinder, Kirchi, Kirchi, Kleider. Yes, that's right, child, kitchen, church, dress and nothing more. Finite. Axioms. Never leave a debt unpaid. Difficulties show people. To make it faster, take your time. If your only weapon is a hammer, consider that all your problems are nails. Most people hear nothing but threats or promises. When you compromise, you lose. Pretending to compromise is a step towards victory. Agreements exist only to be broken. Every situation has two facets. Every coin has two sides. Every fall has two ends. The time to pay the bills sooner or later comes. Calculation is the mother of success, audacity is its father. The wife of a frivolous man is almost a widow. Fortune smiles to then betray. 
All sins grow old, only greed remains young. The wrong choice always seems to make more sense. If you want peace, prepare for war. Wine and girls empty wallets. If you are an anvil, wait, if you are a hammer, strike. When your business is going uphill, everyone will be your friend, and only when you are defeated will you recognize true friends. Failures first come in pairs, and then in formation. Never hope that logic and reason will determine human relationships. Luck favors the strong. A hopeless situation can only change for the better. Don't make enemies unnecessarily. Do not teach your soldiers all the tricks so as not to become your own victim. To deceive the enemy, feign fear. If you have the keys to the door, then let the enemy come out. It's better when your enemies overestimate your stupidity than your insight. In a cold house, try to find a warm place. Sometimes the wisest thing is to pretend to be a sucker. After milking the sucker, do not forget to calm him down. The future is paid for with the present. Behind every show-off idiot, you can easily find an eccentric woman. At the end of the war, many heroes appear. A cockroach in a bowl of cabbage is better than no meat. 1. Don't forget to sharpen the knife. You can't buy luck, but you can borrow it. Failure always comes through an unlocked door. When you are dominated by emotions and feelings, you should not rely on logic and common sense. If you haven't been on the street, you can't claim to know her. Nobody dies twice. If others fold when you have a good hand, hide your cards better from them. Strike first to strike last. If you don't have a lion on a leash, leave the sleeping dogs alone. Victories are temporary, and so are defeats, sharks live in calm waters. All the best theories fail the test in practice. Unhappy is the family where the hen cackles when the rooster is silent. Silence is rid of errors. People can be bought at different prices. The blood of the enemy is the wine of victory. Treat strangers as friends, but trust them as strangers. There are no cheap politicians. When the wine is drunk, it is better to throw away the bottle. What is goose gravy is goose gravy. To live according to someone else's orders is suffering for some, a necessity for a few, happiness for the majority. Never cook in someone else's kitchen. Teasing a bear cub angers a bear. Anger is the wind that blows out the candle of consciousness. Wealth is not wealth, but just wealth. At sea, all people are brothers, but brothers with a lifeline will not share it with others. Only a fool turns back when he has reached his goal. Whatever you do is enough. Don't tie dogs with pig intestines. Most disagreements can be resolved in bed. Fear is often masked by boldness. When deceiving the rich, do not insult them. Do not rely on fame in the morning and mother-in-law's smile in the evening. The enemy is most dangerous when he looks defeated. Beat your wife on your wedding day and your married life will be long and happy. Any fool can perfectly rest in peace. When hunting, let the beast come to you. An eagle in old age is just as dangerous as in youth. Learn to forgive your enemies, posthumously. And the man's cradle is in his grave. It just is.